Hello, everyone. Today, we're proud to welcome Dr. Theoharis Theoharides to our live Autism Research Coalition talk. Dr. Theoharides has a unique and very important understanding of how mast cells can contribute to the pathogenesis of autism. I want to introduce myself. My name is Suzanne. I'm the parent of an 18-year-old with autism who has a mast cell disease, and I have a mast cell disease myself. We were both diagnosed in 2012. My co-presenter today is Tara Marshall. She's an autistic adult with suspected mast cell disease. She works with autistic children as a speech language pathologist and runs a support group for autistic adults. Assistant. Dr. Theoharden. Speech assistant. Been, speech assistant, okay. Dr. Theoharides has been studying mast cells and their role in allergic and inflammatory diseases for over 30 years. It was the first to report that mast cells can regulate blood-brain barrier permeability, secrete mitochondrial DNA that results in brain inflammation, and mast cells involvement in inflammation of the brain, especially as it relates to the pathogenesis of autism spectrum disorders and myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome. These are diseases that are often comorbid and they affect multiple organisms without effective treatment. There's a full version of Dr. Thea Hardy's biography available on the post of the video. Today, Dr. Thea Hardy is going to discuss the role of mast cell activation in the pathogenesis of autism. We'll reserve time at the end of the presentation for questions. You can use the chat box to the right of your screen to suggest questions, and Tara and I will then suggest questions that are general in nature. So please don't ask questions that are patient specific. People can support the mission of the Autism Research Coalition and the Brain Foundation by making tax deductible contributions to the link at the bottom of the page. All funds donated go to research and subtitling to translate our lectures into multiple languages. Welcome Dr. Thea Hardis. Well, it's a real pleasure and I'm very grateful for uh, being allowed to share our research and, and our hopes uh, for the future. Can you see the slides okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, you can actually pretty much see everything that I will discuss on the mustcellmaster.com. Uh, I will start with some simple information. I apologize if some of you uh, know it, and then I will go into more direct uh, scientific results, and then I'll try to summarize uh, at the end. So let me start by, first of all, a graph that you uh, all know that indicates in about 2025, we might have one in 45 children being diagnosed with autism. So in my mind, this is a worse pandemic than the coronavirus pandemic we're going through. Of course, the only difference is with the coronavirus, unfortunately people die and that's why we're scared and we act uh, swiftly rather than uh, worrying, unfortunately, as we should about the children on the spectrum. Uh, very important point is that we still don't know the pathogenesis there's still no effective treatment. And if we're talking about you know, dollars, the estimated amount is gonna be about half a trillion uh, by 2025. Now, why have we made not enough progress? Well, there can be many reasons. One of the reasons is that uh, there are actually many uh, comorbidities uh, in the children and adults with autism. And even within uh, the autism spectrum, as we all know, the severity of the symptoms varies tremendously. So in order to analyze and come up with biomarkers or potential treatments, we really need to look and establish secure a more quote unquote homogeneous population because otherwise the results are so scattered that the possibility of getting significance is uh, very uh, uh, narrow. Now, many years ago, uh, after, of course, we started studying mast cells, this, is, this was published in 2012, uh, a colleague of mine who got her doctorate degree with me, the first author, who just recently published another paper in uh, JAMA uh, Pediatrics. And we wrote a review for which we included this graph. And this graph basically said that a lot of different factors can contribute uh, to the higher risk of autism. You know, we, we spoke about placental dysfunction, maternal infections, 
Of course, susceptibility genes, of which there are many, but we don't really understand how they work, except in certain cases, you know, autoimmunity, autoantibodies, you know, infections, allergies that we will talk about, environmental toxins, I'll touch upon, etc. And I think all of those converge uh, in certain individuals to increase the risk of autism. Since that paper was published, a number of papers have actually supported this diagram. One of the most recent ones was just published in September 2021 that you can see talks about the importance of preterm, early term uh, birth and especially low birth weight, uh, which of course we uh, invoked even in that graph, you know, more than 10 years ago. Uh, so as you will see, many of the things that we and some other colleagues said earlier on have actually uh, been supported by additional findings. So we are not the way we were back then. You know, back then I felt like I was a Don Quixote, basically just, uh, you know, in the wind. The difficulty as I will end up with is even though a lot of these findings have been supported, funding for this research remains almost non-existent. So what are conditions stimulating both fetal mast cells and or associated with increased risk of, of autism? Uh, years back in 2015, this was the cover of a European journal of pediatric allergy. And as you can see, shows a pregnant mother and a lot of the things that the mother is exposed to may infect the fetus. I will give you evidence to that shortly. And a very good paper was published in the journal Science in 2016, talking about back then was an umbrella term, maternal immune activation. Um, but this term has been expanded to other types of activation that we will discuss. But suffice it to say, there's very good evidence about allergies, asthma, atopic dermatitis or eczema, high fever, uh, mast cell activation that I'll talk about, and of course, stress about which I will talk about. And preeclampsia uh, often goes together with stress. Preeclampsia is you know, fairly bad uh, for the fetus, uh, high blood pressure in the mother, etc. And I will touch upon a little bit uh, on COVID-19 at the beginning and at, at the end of the presentation. Now, this slide shows three very important papers in my mind. One paper was published again in Science not long uh, ago, that was a few months ago, and they showed, much to my surprise, and I thought I was a, an expert on mast cells, that the mast cells in the fetus are not immature, they're quite mature, and they respond to anything the mother is exposed to. In this paper, they showed that immunoglobulin E, which is the major trigger for allergies, can actually trigger fetal uh, mast cells. Another paper showed that stressful events during gestation increase the cord blood IgE, which of course makes things worse and allows for the babies to be born to have a propensity to have either at least the possibility of developing eczema or full-blown eczema and asthma. And we wrote back in 2009, a small epidemiological study that got us interested in this field where we actually showed that mothers that had either severe allergy or a disease called mastocytosis that I will describe again later, where in these patients, there are about 10 times more mast cells and activated mast cells than the natural sort of uh, um, course of events in individuals that otherwise are considered normal. Those mothers had a 10 times higher risk of uh, having children that developed autism. So going back to this diagram, which I will show you later in a different form, uh, we believe that whatever happens during gestation not only affects the possibility of the children uh, born to have asthma or skin reactions, but the development of the brain, especially in the amygdala that regulates behavior would be affected. And as I'll tell you later, a natural molecule or molecules like that may inhibit that process. And in the course of this presentation, I will talk about how mast cells involved in allergy also communicate with microglia that are the brain defenders and how that might lead to inflammation of the brain. So what did we know 
even early on before I got interested in the field. Well, we know that papers were published showing comorbidities. In this first paper in the top, they showed there was a very significant association between food intolerance and autism. And I will describe food intolerance as compared to allergies a little later. But since then, three major papers were published with very large uh, cohort of patients uh, showing that there is an association with food allergy and other allergic conditions uh, and the risk of autism. Uh, here they call it food hypersensitivity and risk of autism. And another paper about food allergy induces allergic brain uh, uh, inflammation changes and affects cognitive impairment. So before I go into further details, if we look for allergy, and I will tell you how we test for it, we definitely talk about the involvement of immunoglobulin E or IgE. When we talk about food hypersensitivity, we mostly talk about IgG4, a subclass of immunoglobulins. And then I'll talk about another condition we call mast cell activation, where the number of mast cells is the same as in normal individuals. The propensity for allergies is about the same. However, those individuals react to everything under the sun. So they're not allergies. It's not hypersensitivity, but they may respond to smells, for instance, or to stress. Also, there have been papers that are quite telling. There's immune conditions that might otherwise be called autoimmune conditions associated with autism. Uh, there was a paper about immune allergic response. And many times medicine uses jargon terms that don't really mean anything. And I apologize for the profession. I mean, if something is allergic, it's allergic. There's no such thing as immune allergic response. Sometimes we call about allergic inflammation, which is different, like it occurs in asthma, where other cell types in addition to mast cells come in. And then there was uh, a unique paper published out of Egypt where they looked for the presence of autoantibodies against the brain. About 15% of children have such autoantibodies. Uh, colleagues such as Dr. Zimmerman, Dr. Van der Water have published plenty on this. But this paper was very important because at least in the patients they studied, those that had autoantibodies against their brain were the ones that have allergic problems. So that was one of the first indications to me published in 2013, that whenever there are allergic manifestations might be also other problems uh, in the brain that were not quite obvious uh, to anybody at the time. So how about mast cells? Well, you might not have heard the word mast cells before, uh, but the mast cells were discovered, I will not show you the evidence now, in 1887 by the German physician <clears throat> Uh, who was, you know, very well known uh, at the time. And he was studying various cells and how he can identify them in tissues. And he used a blue dye and some of the cells stain blue, as you can see here, the blue granules. But if the cells were in a different state, they turn violet. And he called that metachromasia from the Greek, a change of color. Uh, but he did not know what the cells were doing. But because he saw in the microscope that there were about 500 such, he didn't know there were granules, such sort of structures within the cell, he thought that the cell was feeding other surrounding cells. And because the word breast that feeds the baby is from the Greek mastos, that's why we say, you know, mastectomy, for instance, God forbid, etc. He called it mast cells because he thought they were feeding other cells. Well, he could have been more wrong, but he got the Nobel Prize and the term stayed. So here we are. And many patients were asking me to write something in a more general journal rather than just allergy journals, because many physicians don't read esoteric allergy journals. And they said, well, why don't you publish something in the New England Journal of Medicine? Well, it took us four years, uh, 52 drafts, uh, and a lot of pain and anguish uh, but eventually, I'm grateful that the journal published this review of ours, and they allowed us three things. One, they allowed us to say mast cells in general, mastocytosis, which is rare, 
one in about 20,000 people, but open the door by allow us to say related disorders. And then they allowed us to also include this graph where you see that in addition to allergens, which are not even shown on this slide, environmental triggers, uh, uh, fungi, bacteria, viruses, drugs, various peptides in the body, as well as various growth factors and cytokines can trigger the mast cell. So allergy is literally the tip of the iceberg as far as I'm concerned, and we should not limit ourselves to allergic responses whenever I think of mast cells. Another very important paper uh, is shown at the bottom. The mast cell binds immunoglobulin E, Ig, on a specific receptor type. However, the mast cells are found in the tissues and Ig circulates in the blood. So the question always, how on earth do the mast cells find the Ig to bind to it? Well, in this paper, which showed these wonderful videos, but of course these are not videos here, show a mast cell in blue in a bifurcation of a red blood vessel. And the arrow shows a little philopodium. You can't quite see it. Maybe you can see it a little bit on the darker side to the right. So the mast cells at any time, they're found perivascularly and they throw philopodia, they go through endothelial gaps and they sense what happens in the bloodstream. So the mast cells are not only found on skin and mucosa in the gut and in our mouth, in which case they would sense the outside the world, but they sense the inside world. As far as I'm concerned, it's the best sensor of anything can go wrong in our body. And then they send messages out to various other cell types, as we'll discuss. So the mast cells existed for 300 million years, worms, octopi, feces have mast cells, they never get allergic reactions. So they must be doing something there useful. And one of the things that is clearly useful is the mast cells are absolutely necessary to expel parasites. So the mast cells are not necessarily bad. I think they've gone bad as the humans evolved, and then we got antibiotics and we got physicians and we got whatever, and then they remain there to alert us to what has remained to be bad for our bodies. So my goal for 30 years, and I'm sorry I don't have the answer yet, uh, even though I will finish by telling you that, is can we basically regulate the mast cell so that it can release molecules that can be protective and then shut the molecules that are destructive in our body. So since then, other colleagues, two of the colleagues here were co-authors in my review, Dr. Akin, and Dr. Valent, and Dr. Metcalf is the chief of NIH section on mast cells, described a different condition, a mast cell activation syndrome. This was ear, uh, music to my ears because the first time they included, as you can see in the blue box, neurologic complaints. No one has actually linked the brain to the mast cell, at least clinically. I mean, we had published, as you will see papers long before that about brain mast cells. And very telling, it was brain fog. So difficulty, cognitive dysfunction, difficulty remembering uh, brain fog. Since then, other colleagues, as you can see at the bottom, wrote about cognitive impairment in mastocytosis. We know this uh, quite definitively now. And I wrote a review uh, that I tried to change the name because in pharmacology, and after all, uh, I qualify myself as a pharmacologist. We talk about activation of receptors, but stimulation of cells. So I tried to change the name to mast cell mediator disorder, but it didn't take. So we still talk about mast cell activation disorder. What does the mast cell look like? If you look at the top left-hand side, this is like fake uh, three-dimensional optics. In fact, if you go to the New England Journal of Medicine, which is free, uh, there is a supplementary video and you can see the mast cell exploding within 15 seconds. And this is a still picture from that video. You can see the indentation here, it's the nucleus, and all those dots are the secretory granules. In fact, I don't know of any cell type that can contain so many granules, each of which contains about 50 molecules ready to be released. And as you will see, uh, in a second, it can make another 50 molecules without releasing from the granules. So 
if you, these are images from our own uh, laboratory. This is electron microscopy about a thousand times magnified. So you can see the shadowy in the middle area, that's the nucleus, all the granules. If you are undergoing an allergic or anaphylactic reaction, anaphylactic is like the worst of an allergic reaction, you can see it explodes like a hand grenade releasing all the corner of the granules. However, we've shown the different stimuli, such as stress stimuli, such as uh, lipopolysaccharide, LPS from bacteria, uh, and some uh, cytokines released from other immune cells, make the granules that you can see here change their appearance. It looks like honeycomb appearance, and they never release histamine or the well-known enzyme tryptase. So the mast cell can degranulate, and within 30 minutes at the most, we release things like histamine, uh, tryptase, uh, you know, leukotrienes that cause broken constriction, prostaglandins that cause pain, etc. But subsequent to that, and over a period of 24, 24, 48 hours, it will release especially inflammatory molecules. And even though these molecules can be released subsequently to histamine, they can be released without any histamine when the triggers are cytokines or peptides, I'll talk about substance P and neurotensin, bacteria, viruses, etc. So the mast cell is very dynamic. And not only that, but if you have a propensity for allergy and then you're hit by a stressful event, the whole reactivity of the mast cell can change. And now you can move from being allergic to being mast cell activation, where now you respond to pretty much everything. Now, what are the typical diseases that we involve with mast cells? And if we don't really know what the trigger is, but we suspect that Ig is still involved, we call that atopic diseases. Okay? So we have allergies, we've got asthma, we've got eczema. Food intolerance, as I said, involves the mast cells, but involves IgG4, not IgE. And then when we don't understand something in medicine, we call it idiopathic. So we sound, you know, important. So idiopathic urticaria is basically itching of unknown origin. 50% of this itching is autoimmune. And if you're interested, I can talk about it during the Q&A. Of course, mastocytosis, uh, which is many mast cells, mast cell mediator or mast cell activation syndrome, whatever you want to call it, where the muscles are activated by many triggers. Sometimes we call it non-IG food allergy rather than calling it food intolerance. So you might see these terms and then urticaria pigmentosa, where there are little spots on the skin that are full of mast cells and they're very itchy, but it's not cancer, it's not melanoma, and it's very common uh, in children. But in addition to the mast cells doing whatever they do, as I said, they communicate with other immune cells and pathogens. So here is a mast cell talking to macrophages that chew up bacteria, to T cells that are involved in uh, viruses, and of course, cancer. And the mast cell expresses receptors in addition to IgE that are notoriously activated by pathogens. We call them toll-like receptors or TLR. And eventually, the release from the mast cells can affect the endothelium, meaning the blood vessels, and induces inflammation. I chose two papers to show you here because they're quite telling. One paper, not from us, of course, shows that the mast cells respond to Borrelia, which is the primary uh, bacterium involved in Lyme disease. But as you can see, mast cells activation and cytokine release, no histamine, no tryptase, no degranulation. These are the things that the allergists look for. No IgE. Here is a paper indicating that the mast cell respond to sporothrix. This is a type of yeast. Uh, and, and we will talk about yeast you know, a little later uh, again. And two cytokines are released, interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor, no degranulation, no histamine release. So we really have to stop thinking of the mast cells being just a typical allergy for which our colleagues, the allergists, that do you know, skin testing. Of course, that's important because some patients are truly allergic. But then what do we do with everything uh, else? But to go back to the brain and eventually to autism, is there any evidence that atopic diseases contribute to behavioral problems? Well, there are such findings without even my own or our own 
uh, scientific uh, results that I will share with you. Here are papers about allergic diseases in preschoolers associated with behavioral problems. Association of atopic diseases with ADD. Uh, again, early childhood ADD, ADD, ASD with atopy. And a most recent study, comorbidity of allergic autoimmune diseases in patients with ADD, ADD, and I'll show you some more. These are very large epidemiologic studies. So back you know, 10 years ago when I started talking about this, someone from an IH said this is impossible. Well, now these papers are published one after the other in very good journals. So we should go way past the fact that this happens and try to find out what we can do about it. So how do we diagnose atopic diseases? First of all, if I were to see a child or an adult with uh, dark circles under the eyes, we call them allergic shiners, moonshiners, 90% of the time, there is something there that has, has not been discovered yet. Meaning there is either allergy or mast cell activation or food problems, etc. And in most of these patients, if you use just your nail or, or a dull sort of you know, object without you know, a splinter or a point, and you do this on the back or on the under um, uh, arm, within one minute, you get this line. Uh, this is called dermatographia. It's like you know, someone whipped you and then it disappears about three minutes. That means that the mast cells in the skin responded just to the pressure of your nail. You just need one continuous you know, hard uh, movement. So that tells you that the mast cells in these individuals are already ready to fire because they fire to the pressure and God knows, excuse the word God, you know, what else they might actually be responding uh, to. So I usually, you know, either ask for individual or in some companies uh, they might have panels. So for instance, LabCorp, what they call is urticaria panel and they include some of what I include uh, here or you can go individually. So we need the total IG and the total subfractions, IgG1 and IgG4. I already told you IgG4 is involved with food intolerance or hypersensitivity, if you wish. But I also included a paper, which was very important in my mind, in a very good journal, Brain Behavior and Immunity, that they showed increased levels of IgG4 in children of the spectrum that actually didn't even have food intolerance, or at least food intolerance wasn't obvious. So this ties, if you wish, the possible connection. I ask for immune Ig, sometimes we call it the RAS test, but for this one, you have to ask for specific antigens. So I usually ask for alpha-gal, which is found in red meat, not in chicken, uh, uh, casein, and gluten, because many of the children are intolerant, although they might not be allergic, dust mites, dust, you know, and about five different types of fungi, you know, grass pollen, and then depending where they live, I might ask, you know, for other things. So, you know, in Greece, there are a lot of, you know, cypress trees and, and pine trees, so I'm asked for pine. You know, but elsewhere, it might be something else. Um, then I ask for something which is very important for autoimmune urticaria. Why is it autoimmune? Because the body makes antibodies against the receptor for IgE. And some people call this basophil activation test or histamine release test, or Ig receptor antibody. Uh, I ask for uh, uh, two chemokines. Uh, this is a misnomer, actually. Many people call this IL-8, but it's, it's not a cytokine. It's actually a chemokine called CXCL8, a food intolerance panel. There are many uh, labs that will do food intolerance panel. Some are better than others. One that I prefer, and I have no connection to it, is called Pinner Test in New York. Uh, they can send you basically the kid, you prick the finger, you send it back. But many of my colleagues don't believe this because if you eat something every day, you will end up being false positive. So if you do a food intolerance panel, wherever you send it, you have to request that someone literally doesn't eat pretty much anything for like three to five days. And of course, the question comes, you know, my child's going to starve. And then I usually say, I've never seen anybody being allergic to chicken and rice. And this is the typical, you know, Greek soup if you're sick. So I usually say if someone can tolerate chicken and rice for three days, just avoid everything else because otherwise uh, it will be false positives. Some people measure heparin because mast cells are very uh, uh, rich in heparin, but many labs don't do this. There are other cytokines that LabCorp, Mayo Clinic, Quest will do. And then of course the enzyme tryptase, which is high 
pretty much in those individuals who have truly mastocytosis. In most everybody else is not high. But at the end of the day, uh, prostaglandin and histamine will be broken down within one minute. I didn't put histamine here, even though a lot of people measure histamine, because I think it's literally useless unless the basophils which circulate and are like mast cells, but they're not mast cells, release it, it's gone in a minute. So I prefer urine for 24 hours. Of course, in small children, you cannot collect it for 24 hours. First morning urine uh, might be good, uh, but it has to be cold and sent cold. If it warms up at room temperature even for 10 minutes, uh, the measurements are useless. And then you ask for the metabolite of histamine, methyl histamine, or MIA, which is even better, methyl imidazole acetic acid, prostaglandin D2, and the metabolite of prostaglandin D2, most laboratories abbreviated 23-BPG, uh, but that's the whole name if you want to write it out. Now, since then, there have been additional epidemiological studies. Uh, you see here immune-mediated conditions and autism, co-occurrence of autism and asthma, maternal immune diseases, asthma allergies, uh, and autism, and association between eczema and autism. Some of this, especially the last one, was like 27,000 children done by Kaiser Permanente down in Florida. So we're not talking about one and two children. So if anybody tells you there's no connection, just, just tell them to go to the library and read. Uh, I mean, it's, it's absolutely unacceptable anymore for someone to say there's no relationship between uh, allergies, you know, mast cells, uh, and autism, and especially uh, ADD as well. So uh, after you know, publishing a lot, some of which, of course, I'll share very quickly shortly, we made this hypothesis that, uh, and I strongly believe that we're not talking a pathology in the sense that you know, someone has you know, a microorganism and got infected or whatever. I think some children and adults um, might have been born with a little mismatch in terms of how they sense stress. And the hippocampus is the area of the brain that remembers. And of course, the amygdala are the area of the brain that senses emotions, understands emotions, and then responds with emotions. And hippocampus and amygdala talk to each other uh, all the time. Uh, so let's call this the fear threshold. Okay. I really believe that some individuals just have a different fear threshold. And some individuals are very shy and some individuals are very extroverted. You know, that's not pathology necessarily. But for those individuals where the fear threshold is lower, if now something lowers the threshold even more, and that could be inflammation, it could be excess of histamine, uh, you know, it could be maybe, a, you know, even a subclinical viral infection, then, and this is taken out of this uh, article, then I believe that that stress overcomes the body and then the body spends most of its time trying to deal with these stressful events, not necessarily you know, in a cognitive fashion. I don't think the, the body, the brain understands. It's just that they feel they're bombarded. And you know how many children and adults we see you know, they're afraid of, you know, thunder. They're afraid of the raindrops on the window pane. They're afraid of, you know, things spinning, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we know because there are other publications, some of which I'll show you, that they cannot handle stress very well. They might hear, you know, parents, you know, yelling at each other, you know, for, for minor things. But their response will be way out of uh, context or out of, you know, sync with what might be happening. So I think that stressful peptides such as corticotropin releasing hormone or tensin as substance P basically just weigh heavily on, on the stress uh, response and therefore the balance tips and the body is literally in a constant fight or flight reaction. So the question that becomes, do the muscle respond to stress? Well, we've published this galore. I mean, this is one of the most recent reviews uh, in 2020 about the impact of psychological stress on mast cells and I will show you real data, you know, how that uh, actually happens. But since I told you about kind of the stress, the fear response, then the question is, does prenatal stress contribute to allergy? Let's go back to allergy before I switch back to autism. Well, here are good papers about prenatal maternal stress. I mean, I already told you earlier about one that increases IgE 
in the fetus. Hear about just stress during gestation, making the child bigger topic. In other words, having allergies. Here's maternal psychological problems increasing the risk of childhood eczema, topic dermatitis. Association be between maternal perceived stress in all trimesters of pregnancy and infant atopic dermatitis. So now we know mast cells are activated by stress. Question is how? Uh, atopy can actually change just because of stressful events during the mother, uh, uh, in the mother during gestation. So how does this actually happen? So let's go to the brain now. Are there any mast cells in the brain? Well, here's a study we published, my goodness, almost 20 years ago, where we looked at the number of mast cells in rats after they're born. And you can see days three, five, six days after they're born, they have a tremendous number of mast cells and then the number of mast cells drop out. So here's one paper. Here's another paper. Uh, I flip flop, by the way, the titles, I apologize. The top title uh, goes to the color picture that I'll discuss in a second, and this one, uh, goes actually with uh, uh, this slide. You can see actually about a thousand times magnified a blood vessel going vertically down, a nerve ending going almost horizontally, and a mast cell piggybacking on that. That's from um, a, a rat brain. And here's a magnified again from our laboratory, 200,000 uh, diameters, seeing some granules of one mast cell, here granules of another mast cell, and what is N is a non terminus. And the tiny little arrows indicate synaptic vesicles that contain neurotransmitters. Well, 50% of each granule of the mast cell is this enzyme tryptase, which is a meat tenderizer. So you can imagine if that is released, that's the, 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 end, the terminus of the nerve is just gone. Uh, if histamine is released, it will activate the nerve. If prostaglandin is, is released, it will activate the nerve. So literally, I believe that we short circuiting the system whenever the mast cells release these molecules. And in this paper, that corresponds to the top title there, uh, you see what we see here is nerve ending. Um, here's actually synaptic termini. And then when, when this stretches out, we call it an axon or axonic like, uh, you know, a part of, of the nerve. And all of the, the, so these are culture nerves and culture mast cells. And you can see the nerves put out axons that basically go and touch to the mast cells. So the mast cells don't necessarily have to be entirely adjacent to the nerves or nerve endings, but they can communicate. See how long this uh, axonic process is that eventually reaches out uh, to the mast cells. So there's no question that the mast cells can talk either with what is called nanotubules here, because we're not sure that they're true axons, uh, or by direct uh, contact. Well, let's go back to the brain now. Is there any evidence that stress can uh, make the risk for developing autism worse? Well, here's a paper of prenatal development uh, and mental health, prenatal mental stress, ADHD, uh, prenatal stress and risk of autism, prenatal stress, and again, immune dysregulation in the brain, which I kind of showed you in some slides before. So now we know mast cells can be activated during uh, gestation. Uh, stress can activate those mast cells. Stress can activate maternal processes uh, to make uh, atopic diseases worse, and all of those are likely to increase the risk of autism. So where are the mast cells in the brain? Well, they're found exactly in the hypothalamus and the amygdala. And we wrote this paper in 1990, calling the mast cells the immune gate to the brain. And more recently, uh, we basically said, 2013, that there might be localized focal brain inflammation in those areas, hypothalamus and amygdala, that regulate homeostasis and emotions. And to finish the mast cell part, this is a cross-section of a blood vessel in the brain from a human, actually. You can see a red blood cell inside the lumen of the blood vessel. You see the endothelial cells that make up the wall of the blood vessel marked with a knee. And then the P is a pericyte. The pericyte covers. So the endothelial cells and the pericytes make the blood-brain barrier to protect the brain. And here's a mast cell literally hugging the blood-brain barrier. So if the muscles are activated, they will also disrupt the blood-brain barrier and are circulating either environmental or other molecules from the blood will get into the brain. And what happens if they get in the brain? Well, the first thing that will happen is open up the blood-brain barrier. How do we 
check for that. Well, we can put cagnesium gluceptate, which is used in humans as well as the tail vein of a mouse. Then you put it into a plexiglass immobilizer from which they cannot move, but they can breathe, they can see, they can smell. And 15, one, five minutes later, we can sacrifice the animal and look for how much of the marker comes out. And you can see here, tremendous amount of the marker, which otherwise should have stayed in the blood vessels comes out. But if we do this in mice that are genetically deficient of mast cells, nothing happens. So we absolutely need the mast cells for, to open up the blood brain barrier. And if you then stain for the presence of corticotropin releasing hormone, the main hormone released under stress, stained here, kind of, you know, goldish, you see a mast cell very close to nerve fibers containing tons of corticotropin releasing hormone, which would be released during stress. So then we went to human mast cells and we looked to see if on their surface they have receptors that will bind the hormone, all hormones that bind the receptor. And we make those antibodies fluorescent. And as you can see, human culture mast cells light up like light bulbs. So there's no question that they bind corticotropin releasing hormone, both within the brain and outside the brain. So it's not all our mind. You know, we don't have to send someone to a psychiatrist because they get worse, you know, when they're stressed. We know exactly what happens. And if you measure what is being released, we measure release of vascular endothelial growth factor uh, that makes the blood vessels leaky. And you can see how much comes out and no tryptase, no histamine whatsoever. So the muscles don't degranulate. And we show that that happens in the skin as well. And to make things worse, there's another molecule uh, called neurotensin that is released under stress. And neurotensin makes the human mast cells grow more receptors for CRH. So you can see the mast cell is not uh, you know, static, it's very dynamic, and it will keep on responding uh, to the environment. Then we showed that a cytokine released from immune cells under stress called interleukin-33, it's called an alarming, if it's given together with another peptide substance P that is released under stress, it releases much more VEGF. And then again, substance P makes the mast cells grow more receptors for CRH, just like neurotensin does. And to make things even worse, when the mast cells release these molecules, they release another molecule called hemokinin 1, which is 99% similar to substance P. And hemokine acts back on the mast cell and makes it now be more susceptible to responding to true allergens via IgE. So that's why I said someone might be uh, sort of mildly allergic and then something happens, stressful event, then havoc basically breaks loose. And that's because of these interactions. In addition, we showed that substance PNL33 together can release horribly high amounts of tumor necrosis factor and even, you know, as bad amounts of interleukin-1 beta, TNF and interleukin-1 beta are the best known pro-inflammatory cytokines. In fact, these levels of these cytokines are more than any other immune cell in the body. So if the mast cells are triggered under the right circumstances, they're not only pro-allergic, but they're also pro-inflammatory. So as a summary, and I have about 10 slides left, uh, the mast cells respond to neural, endocrine, and immune triggers, and they eventually participate in inflammation, as you can see in this review, and many other colleagues have written reviews about mast cell and inflammation. So what can actually trigger an inflammatory response? Well, it's not only, of course, coming from the mast cells. So there are papers that electromagnetic waves can trigger inflammation, heavy metals can do it. I don't have time to talk about mitochondrial DNA, the kindly the person who introduced me mentioned. Mycotoxins, we wrote two reviews on mycotoxins, mast cells and, and brain problems. And of course, a number of viruses, uh, venoms, and xenobiotics that are found basically in plastics. And at the end of the day, this was from the very well-known journal Nature, we still don't know what exactly causes inflammation in the brain, unfortunately. So just one slide about COVID-19. Clearly viruses can trigger the mast cells, we know that. The question is, can the coronavirus trigger the mast cells? But the, the bottom 
answer is yes. Uh, but I want to share just two papers with you before I describe this caricature. Here is a paper about association of maternal, perinatal infections and neonatal outcomes. This was published by the same uh, doctorate student of mine that I mentioned earlier, Dr. Angelidu, and she showed that as many as 60% of mothers deliver actually preemie babies, and we already discussed the preemie babies and low uh, birth weight is, is bad for the possibility uh, of developing autism, and it's not just the birth weight, it's because these uh, uh, preemies go into incubation chambers, and then you have maternal separation stress uh, in addition. Here's a paper about maternal COVID-19, potential risk of autism, uh, and this showed that there was actually transmission, I'm sorry, this paper, direct transmission from the mother to the baby. And uh, Simon's Foundation uh, announced some months back uh, a fund to follow mothers that were positive for COVID for the possibility that the risk of autism might be increased, but it will take probably a couple of years to have those results. So the bottom line here is we believe environmental, neuroimmune, and you know, pathogenic stimuli can enter the brain either through a disrupted blood-brain barrier or through the nose, which communicates directly through the olfactory nerve with the brain, that the mast cells can be activated, they will activate microglia, or the microglia can be activated, and this can actually be inhibited as I will finish talking about today. I'm not going to say a lot about how to track inflammation, but I always ask for pro-inflammatory molecules and anti-inflammatory molecules because there's always a yin-yang. And of course, the worst would be a lot of pro-inflammatory and very few anti-inflammatory molecules. A molecule that I tend to measure a lot these days is calprotectin and procalcitonin. I find they're much better indicators of inflammation than C-reactive protein or uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. However, as I said, there are no immune cells in the brain except for the mast cell. This is phenomenal. The brain doesn't get allergic reactions, but it's got lots of mast cells in the critical areas. But the only defender is microglia. Now, microglia are very good early in development because they will prune, like we prune trees, the bad synapses and allow the good synapses kind of to, to grow. But if they sense danger, either through direct infection or through the blood-brain barrier, through the nose or whatever, they literally multiply like the clones in Star Wars and they start attacking either the real or perceived danger. So here you see microglia start actually uh, breaking down connections. Uh, here they looked at the genes of microglia and they found them. These are very good papers. Nature is like one of the best journals in the world. Uh, this was 107 brains of children that had died from uh, drowning or car accidents. All the brains are activation of microglia. And now, most recently, they mimic this in animals, and they showed, as you know, with genes, the genes might be activated, but they may not make their product, which is protein. Here now, they've shown protein made uh, out of microglia with you know, aut autism-like behavior. And the only way to see it non-invasively is with SPECT scans. So SPECT scan is single positron emission CAT scan. Uh, not all the hospitals have it. There's a group of uh, clinics called uh, AMES, AMES, that have it, and then some other clinics might have it. But as you can see here in three parts of uh, individuals who were healthy, you don't see any microglia activation. And you can see how the microglia is activated here uh, in brains of autistic uh, children. So one can look at them, although this is the only non-invasive way so far. So we believe that the mast cells talk to the microglia, as I told you. Neurotensin is one of those molecules, but other colleagues have published that tryptase, this enzyme that I told you about, can activate the microglia and other molecules released from the mast cell. So what did we do? Well, we first said if neurotensin can stimulate the mast cells and the microglia, can we pick it up in the blood of the children? And we do two different studies. Uh, the first study was done in Greece, the second in the United States. And you can see that about 50% of the children have elevated neurotensin in both cohorts. Uh, we studied about 20 different peptides, but only neurotensin was high. So then we said, do the microglia uh, uh, have actually receptors for neurotensin. So we cultured human embryonic microglia and we stained with antibodies uh, that were actually fluorescent. So the green fluorescence shows that the microglia have receptors 
uh, for neurotensin. And if you give the microglia neurotensin, they grow even more receptors. And if you measure the outcome, in this case, interleukin-1 beta, you can see both for primary, uh, meaning from, you know, uh, brains that were recently harvested, so to speak, uh, versus transformed uh, microglia that stay for a long time. Uh, if we increase two doses of neurotensin, you get lots of interleukin-1 beta release. So the mast cells uh, get activated, but the microglia can get activated as well. And then we looked at another paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, a molecule interleukin-18 that lingers on after inflammation. So interleukin-1, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, TNF, they go up within a few weeks, but then they kind of go down. Interleukin-18 stays longer. So we looked at the amygdala of brains of children that died, and you see controls were way down, and interleukin-18 was way high in the brains. And then we look for the receptor to which interleukin-18 binds, uh, and, and also TNF, and you can see also TNF was high in the receptor. I don't show it here, was also very high. So there's no question, however you look at the brains, that most of the children have inflammation of the brain. But then I, you know, I said, is there anything that is normally available that might block inflammation? Well, my <clears throat> uh, first we looked at what are called microRNAs, and microRNAs are like what is used in some ways in the uh, Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. But there's some microRNAs that are good, some microRNAs that are bad. Well, in this case, uh, they use their messenger RNA, but the microRNAs can also be pro-inflammatory. So we looked at the most pro-inflammatory microRNA known, which is called R155. As you can see here, way up in the amygdala, and uh, uh, the, the gene expression was, you know, uh, way down in the cortex. So that's very important. Not only this was high in the brains of children, but it was only in the amygdala and very low in the cortex. And we published this in Otis uh, in our research. So then we looked for a molecule discovered by Charlie Dinarello, who was a few years ahead of me at Yale, and it's called interleukin-38, and it's supposed to be anti-inflammatory. So we looked at the same brains, and we showed that interleukin-38, as you can see at the bottom, is way low, and its receptor is way low. Well, we said, can we really prove that if it was high, it would be helpful? So we took the same embryonic microglia cultured, we pre-treated them with interleukin-38, three different types of interleukin-38, you know, three different analogs. Then we stimulate them with neurotensin, we measure interleukin-1 beta, and you can see all of them inhibited, but this particular analog inhibited 100%. So technically, we can produce interleukin-38 and we can give it through the nose to go directly to the brain. I've, I've tried three times with NIH uh, and about twice with different other you know, foundations to do this because the company that makes L38 can make L38, I have an agreement with them. And because it's a natural molecule uh, and it's in the nose, it's not considered a drug. It will be basically a medical device and I just cannot get funding uh, to do this. So finishing up, what do we do treatment approaches? Well. There are two conditions that I found quite often in one in about 20, you know, children or adults that contributed to the problems. That's inflammation in the pituitary or pituitary adenoma, or of course, much more common muscle activation disorder. Obviously, we want to minimize or avoid a whole bunch of things. And one thing that I found, you know, very important uh, is just like flame retardants, but as you know, or you may not know, the, re the clothes don't, don't wrinkle are literally covered with formaldehyde. We use formaldehyde to fix cells for microscopy. And I've had many individuals respond to uh, clothes that don't wrinkle because they were coated with formaldehyde. So make sure that you avoid some things that might be you know, fairly uh, well known now. And polyethylene glycol, it's found in practically you know, every uh, filler for, for drugs, for supplements. And of course, it's the main uh, uh, filler ingredient in the vaccines uh, from Moderna and, um, uh, and Pfizer. So if you're allergic uh, or, or sensitive to uh, PEG, you should check, check it out. Uh, then I am a proponent of measuring certain enzymes. 
uh, diamond oxy, many companies, you know, doctors data, meth meth methylation support, you know, uh, others do this analysis now. Uh, diamond oxidase breaks down histamine. MTHFR is very important in, because it produces the active form of folic acid. About 20%, at least of the children, have polymorphism or mutations. And we have to actually supplement with what I call high octane folic acid, which is calcium folinate. And then COMT and some of the liver enzymes that break down basically drugs uh, and toxins. Now, I have to remind you that even though the mast cells make histamine, a lot of foods make histamine. So there is a condition we called histamine intolerance, which is not dependent on mast cells. And as you can see here, sardines, tuna, uh, fermented, uh, you know, aged uh, cheeses, peanuts, eggplant, um, uh, and all the spices have a lot of histamine. So if in fact we have histamine intolerance, uh, and there are some reviews that I show you here about biogenic amines in foods, et cetera, then you have to avoid these foods. Uh, notoriously ripe tomato and ripe avocado have a lot of histamine. Uh, and otherwise you have to give a diamine oxidase, which is the enzyme, a pure encapsulations has a very good uh, preparation of that. I also have to stress out that giving too much antihistamine is not necessarily the best. Histamine is very important in the brain for motivation and learning. So you can't go overboard. And I wrote, wrote reviews about high uh, dosages of antihistamines potentially affecting uh, mental status. And uh, I, the uh, FDA put out a med watch actually a few months ago because a lot of you know teenagers on TikTok uh, were basically for some reason experimenting with taking very high doses of Benadryl and they ended up almost in coma, some of them. So I never go more than about 75 milligrams of anything unless I really know what the hell you know I'm, I'm talking about. And finally, polyphenols that I will finish in the next five minutes talking about, uh, such as you know the flavonoids, uh, you know polyphenols are you know curcumin, resveratrol, um, you know quercetin, you know luteolin, rutin. Uh, all of those are polyphenols, and if you cannot break down the polyphenols, uh, you you have actually a lot of side effects like hyperactivity, et cetera, and they shut down your gut. So you can see here inhibitory effect of polyphenols, so human gut microbiota. Uh, and as, as I will tell you shortly, they are poorly absorbed unless you have certain preparations. So some of my colleagues say, oh, I'll give two grams, like 2,000 uh, you know, milligrams of quercetin, for instance, so that way it will be absorbed. Well, you're still going to absorb about... 5%, 10% at the most, but all the other quercetin or polyphenol will stay in the gut, will shut down all your enzymes, and you'll start spinning your wheels trying to correct basically the dysbiosis in the gut. So for 20 years plus, we've been studying these flavonoids. There are about 3,000 in nature. We wrote a review back in 2000 that is considered a classic in pharmacology. And over 20 years of studying, I came to believe that luteolin shown here is probably the best flavonoid. There are many reviews written, such as these reviews about antioxidant and inflammatory activities. Uh, I wrote a review uh, about brain inflammation and others published reviews and proceedings from National Academy of Sciences. The luteolin inhibits interleukin-6 from microglia, quite important to what I've been telling you about. So basically, luteolin is antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, blocks mast cells, blocks microglia. Uh, it's neuroprotective. It's a weak metal chelator, increases memory. Uh, well, how many do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But you can't go wrong, you know, se seven birds with one stone. And I don't understand why we don't use uh, these molecules uh, more widely than, than we would. So I bit the bullet some years back, and uh, God bless them. Uh, two individuals that I helped uh, help with some conditions unrelated to autism uh, gave some money. We created a small company called Algonaut uh, in Florida. Unfortunately, one of them died a couple of years ago. And we made some supplements. Three points, very important points with this slide. Even if I were to stop here, you know, I'll be happy even though I have, I think, one more slide. First of all, all of those are mixed with olive seed oil. So if you take the olive oil, you're left with the pit and the skin, basically, of the olive. Uh, then, it, you, then you get a little thicker polyphenolic oil. 
Uh, in uh, Italy and Greece, we use it as salad dressing anyhow. It's a little cheaper than olive oil and a little richer. So that we've shown with publication increases absorption about uh, 30% <coughs> to begin with. And depending how much you take, you can reach almost a three to five fold. So you go for with five from 5% 5 absorption in powder form to about 30% absorption. Uh, and because so many other now companies have come up with luteolin containing products, and most of them are really for the birds, I wrote this review, which is free on biofactors called luteolin supplements, all the glitters in our gold. And I looked at all the supplements available in the United States, how much they contain in what for they are. And unfortunately, most of them lie through their teeth. So they might say, you know, 100 milligrams luteolin, but if you read, you have to take, you know, 10 capsules to reach that level. Uh, or they might say proprietary blend, and they don't tell you, you know, how much luteolin was there. In fact, two supplements, if you open them, they're not yellow, and luteolin is yellow. So there, go figure. In addition, uh, even though the Food and Drug Administration cannot regulate supplements in the United States, if you export them, and you ask voluntarily to test them, then they test them as if they were drugs and they require one clinical study, but not double blind the way it would be for a drug. And they give you this certificate. You can see it says you food and drug certificate of free sale. That's what they call it. Uh, it, it can accompany your product when you export it. It's renewable every two years. And all those products uh, have this uh, certificate. Uh, so what I mean to say is that I go to extremes uh, and any money that the company makes, other than the employees of the company, goes uh, back into research. So finally, what do we have? Two clinical studies were done with children with autism, one in, in Greece, I'm not a co-author of that one, uh, and one in the United States. About 30% of the children, uh, there were children 3 to 12 years old, uh, did fairly uh, well to very well. 30% uh, if they had allergic diathesis, the green line did even better faster. And when we measured uh, blood levels of interleukin-6 and interleukin uh, uh, and, and TNF, which I don't show you here, you see that at the beginning of the study, about 50% of the children had high IL-6 in their blood. And three months later, not only they did better behavior-wise, but you can see now the level of interleukin-6 is below control levels. So I think we can predict about 50% of the children in terms of uh, why they have inflammation and how they will respond. Finally, I just wrote this review, it came out last week in the journal of Personalized Medicine. In fact, this whole volume has uh, articles from other colleagues, in, including Dr. Rossignol and Dr. Fry and others. Uh, they asked me to write about mast cell primarily. And I just want to go uh, a little more slow, slower uh, through these because these are very important in my mind. First of all, hyperactivity. I find that 80% of the children are adults, especially the children hyperactive. And as you know, hyperactivity is not part of the diagnosis of autism. So unless I bring that down, I don't think we can do a hell of a lot in terms of treatment. So I use ashwagandha, Chinese herb. Uh, I use chamomile, passiflora, valerian extract. These are short-lived. If I really have a lot of you know, horrible uh, type of you know, anxiety and hyperactivity, I might use clonidine and guanfacine, the block release of catecholamines. Usually we give them at night because they're sedating. Uh, NAC and nedacetylcysteine in two large studies together with Risperdal didn't do very much. Uh, there were nine month studies in 900 milligrams per day. They reduced hyperactivity a little bit. The antihistamine hydroxyzine, I like because it gets into the brain. It's also anti-anxiety. Uh, and we use it for enuresis, so I usually give that at night. And the beta blocker, propranolol, uh, which is, acts differently than clonidine. Clonidine inhibits the release of catecholamines, propranolol, their action. I find it very, very uh, helpful without clouding mental ability, except if somebody's asthma is contraindicated. Allergic inflammation, I found berberine very helpful. Luteolin and quercetin, of course, you know, quite helpful. Uh, Rupatadine is an antihistamine that also blocks mast cells. It's not available in the States, but it's available in Canada. You can get it or compound it from Canada. Uh, vitamin D3, many publications that it's also anti-allergic, uh, at least 2,000 units uh, a day. 
And then what I call neuronal fatigue, if there are mutations of the NTHFR gene, uh, calcium folinate or methyl folate or combination of both, glutathione, however you give it by mouth or uh, intranasal, uh, methyl B12, some people can still not absorb it and they get uh, hyper with it, so you've got to watch it out. And then S-adenosimethanin or SAMI, it's a very good donor of methyl groups, especially if children have methylation defects. And then, of course, as you know, if you've got uh, self-destructive behavior or horrible OCD, you can give aripiprazole or risperidone. Uh, now, about 20% of patients are very phenol intolerant. So I usually ask, you know, if you get hyper with chocolate or berries or strawberries, I know that you're going to be phenol intolerant unless you do the genes that I mentioned earlier. So for children, if they're very phenol intolerant, there's pure lute that has only luteolin or neuroprotect low phenol that has the same amount of luteolin but lower amount of quercetin. With adults, you can go brain gain or neuroprotect. Uh, if someone has horrible allergies with fibroprotect because of the higher levels, and some people that have, you know, bladder or prostate problems, we use this to protect. So uh, only to say that now we've identified a molecule that is much better than luteolin. It's actually methy methoxyluteolin, doesn't have hydroxy groups here. They're methyl groups. So therefore, there's no phenol intolerance. Better methyl donor because it's got methyl groups. We showed both for the mast cells at the top and the microglia at the bottom that you can inhibit them 100%. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have enough to make it because I'd love to put that into an intranasal form uh, and send it up the brain. We managed to put it only in a skin lotion, and we did so because quercetin and luteolin would have turned your skin yellow. This uh, no color. Uh, you can get it at gentlederm.com. Uh, we published a paper that was very well tolerated and very good with eczema, and many, many families tells us uh, tell us that if they rub it on the forehead, uh, they get actually a lot of benefit. And it might be because the methoxyluteolin gets absorbed by the temporal uh, blood vessels. So finally, this is the last slide. I really believe that we're dealing with some kind of uh, mast cell activation in the brain, and you can see a number of reviews. Uh, I managed to get a number of US patents, as you can see here, hoping that it will entice uh, some companies to help us go to the next step. So far, I've struck out. Uh, we absolutely need to make an intranasal form of either methoxyluteolin or interleukin-38. And I really believe we're going to have a tremendous effect uh, on children and adults on, on autism or those that have uh, mental problems because of the allergic uh, type of activity. And most recently, and this is why I'm actually on a sabbatical now in, in Florida, in Sarasota, uh, we're working on long COVID syndrome, whereas you probably know by now the major symptoms are neuropsychiatric, especially brain form. Thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry I went a little over. Thank you, Dr. Hardy. We're really grateful for all the information that was very helpful and informative. And um, before we go forward with questions, I want to find out um, since we ran a little bit over, we're grateful for your time. Do you have a hard stop or can we proceed with a few questions? I'm absolutely fine. I, I think I might have answered some questions through some of the slides, but I'll be happy to take any question. Thank you. We have some really interesting questions from the attendees. Okay. Um, and I want to stay away from questions that are individual. Yes. To any individual person. One of the interesting questions that we had has to do with maternal immune activation. Mm -hmm. A viewer wants to know if PUPP, which is a maternal um, immune activation condition, I believe, right. could have resulted in mast cell activation in a child. Is, is that something that you're familiar with? I'm not familiar with, let me first say that with everything I know, I don't think I or anybody else can say with any certainty that one problem during pregnancy will necessarily uh, lead to development of, you know, of autism. We just don't know that. You know, all of these studies are association studies. And clearly, the more of the problems 
Uh, the, uh, by the way, thank, thank you, many of those, for the comments that I see uh, about my presentation. I appreciate it. I, there, but there's no question in my mind that, number one, the more problems one has, the more one should worry about. Um, and to the extent that we are cognizant of such problems, then we might be able to prevent or minimize them to a large extent ahead of time. Um, so I don't know exactly about PUP, but any autoimmune condition, uh, and I didn't mention that about 60% of the children that I've had uh, the honor literally to, to work with uh, have had parents or themselves have thyroid problems. Again, and again, I'm not saying the thyroid disease leads to autism, but that's thyroid is one of the absolutely uh, first things that I measured uh, in case it is low, because by fixing that, uh, I think we avoid or you know fix other problems kind of uh, on the way. Uh, so, so any any autoimmune disease, especially psoriasis, asthma, eczema, you know preeclampsia, uh, we've got to take it easy. Now, obviously, we cannot give drugs most of the time during pregnancy, but one might avoid maybe exposure, and you know in third trimester, certain drugs or natural molecules are allowed. So at least we can intervene, you know, half the way second to the third trimester uh, to the extent possible. Okay. Uh, you're being very thorough, Doctor, and we greatly appreciate your time. Um, do you know what kind of mast cell diseases autistic people are more likely to develop? Uh, well, first of all, I would take it the other way around. I don't think autistic individuals develop. Uh, it's, I think that those individuals already have uh, a, a mast cell related problem, which contributes at least to the severity of the behavior. Um, from the epidemiological studies, there's no question that eczema and asthma were very high on the list, whether it was present in the mother or in the child. Uh, and then you know, back when those studies were done, we didn't even know about mast cell activation. So no study has done about mast cell activation and autism as of yet. My fear uh, is that it will be even higher. So the first thing that I would recommend is if any mother has eczema or allergies or whatever, at least in the third trimester, they should try to minimize that as, that as much as possible. There's some antihistamines that are allowed in the trimester, avoiding allergens, whether it's food allergens or environmental allergens, you know, is, is an absolutely must. You know, if you were to tell me you work in, you know, um, I don't know, a gas distiller company that, you know, smell, uh, you know, gas fumes uh, at an airport or something like that, I'll say, get 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 out of there. You know, uh, if, if you're in a place that is crawling with mold and there's musty dust uh, and, and smell, by all means, if you can get out of that while you're pregnant, get out of it. Uh, otherwise, use at least you know two large dehumidifiers, and at least two large, uh, and I say two because there might be different rooms, uh, air purifiers. And if in fact there is a place, there's a lot of uh, you know moisture collecting, uh, the the mold releases microtoxins. The microtoxins stick to everything. You can't get rid of them. So. I'm a proponent of those uh, purifiers that have also UV light. Of course, you shouldn't be seeing the UV light. But, you know, if you're going to be away from your bathroom, let's say, for eight hours, I'm just saying, and it's very humid and you cannot do anything about it because you cannot change your home, then just flicker, you know, put, put the uh, UV light on uh, for like six, eight hours. Uh, they do this air conditioning units, you know, especially in Sarasota and other places because, you know, mold co co grows like crazy. Um, so, and then if the baby is born and they start having colicky, you know, kind of behavior, that means there's food intolerance. There's nothing else that causes colics, especially in a small baby. So you've got to find out, you know, do they have casein intolerance, especially at the beginning, milk? And then, you know, as you add on other foods, where there's glute, uh, gluten intolerance. So very quickly, you've got to go through those things. And I, I found children, especially going into crazy behaviors because they were constipated or the, because they were bloated. And, and, you know, that causes a lot of pain. Um, so. I understand. I have chronic constipation myself. Um, got to get rid of it somehow. I've been working on it. Um, okay. Do you 
Do you have any idea of the percentage of autistic people that have a mast cell activation disorder? From my experience and everything I've read, I would say at least 60%. Yeah. But, but I'm including in that food allergy, food intolerance, you know, all, all the above type of thing. Uh, okay, yeah. But it's, it's very high in my mind. And, and I think many of the children uh, that have a lot of, you know, problems with a stool, you know, it might be loose, it might be yellow, it might be smelly, unless, of course, there's some parasites growing, it's, it's food intolerance. So in those cases, uh, and, and that I, I forgot to say, and I should say it, it's important, uh, when I, whenever I, I have problems with stool and we send stool for, let's say, ovarian parasites, I ask for histamine. They can measure total histamine, which is totally unrelated to the systemic histamine. It can be produced just in the gut. So total histamine, I ask for cal protectin uh, in the stool, which indicates uh, basically inflammation in the stool. I ask for eosinophilic cationic protein. It comes from eosinophils that are usually uh, multiplied when they're parasites. Uh, and uh, both LabCorp and Quest do this, eosinophilic cationic protein. And then I ask for either a gliadin, G-L-I-A-D-I-N, or zonulin, Z-O-N-U-L-I-N, for the possibility that might be uh, some, uh, you know, uh, gastro uh, uh, blood sort of disruption on the on the barrier. You know, not, not for blown gluten intolerance, but many individuals have high gliadin and zonally without having full blown gluten allergy. Uh, so in those cases, you know, we will intervene and remove the gluten sooner rather than later. So yeah. Um, so a lot of autistic children have higher rates of eosinophilic disorders. Is that also related to the mast cells? Yes. Uh, in my book, mast cells and eosinophils go hand in hand. Now, there are certain conditions rare. There is familial hyper eosinophilia that doesn't have to do anything with mast cells. Okay? But most of the time, if it's allergy or parasite, you're going to get eosinophilia. So, and you get eosinophilia with, uh, with uh, fung you know, fungi, molds as well. But most of the time, in my mind, they go together. That makes sense. So, and, and we see quite a few children that have eosinophilic gastrophagitis or eosinophilic gastroenteritis. Uh, anytime someone, if in fact they biopsy for eosinophils, they should actually stay in for mast cells as well. Because there, there is a condition, especially in children, that's called... Uh, uh, <clears throat> so it's mast cells that are more only in the intestine. So you can call it in intestinal mastocytosis, if you wish. But we see it only in children, strangely enough. Uh, and those children continue to have problems tolerating food for a long time in their life. Um, so uh, is there, you mentioned that the mast cells can create issues with mitochondrial problems. Uh, is there a known relationship between mast cell disorders and mitochondrial disorders or dysfunction? We published two, two papers, I just didn't have time to, to go into it. We showed that mitochondrial DNA was uniquely high in children with autism compared to a number of other uh, diseases. Uh, just to remind you, mitochondria don't only produce energy, which is important, um, but they were actually bacteria. They became symbiotic with our cells millions of years ago. So if, and in fact, their DNA is very different from the nuclear or genomic, as we call it, DNA, because they just grow differently. They have their own genes to make their own, you know, multiply their DNA, etc. So if any mitochondrial DNA or other material is released outside the cells, it will be misconstrued by the body as a pathogen, as a bacterium. And there will be an auto-inflammatory response generated. So we showed that almost 70% of the children had high mitochondrial DNA and anti-mitochondrial DNA antibodies. There's no other disease except for severe liver cirrhosis that releases mitochondrial DNA and the only other disease in the 30 years I've been following it was a paper five, five months ago that mitochondrial DNA was found in COVID patients. Okay. So, 
Uh, so the, it, it, that's why I'm saying it's not just the histamine or the triplase or the cytokines. There's so many other things that can be released. So therefore, we have to measure them and understand actually what we're dealing with. Because if we're not, if we're not cognizant of what we're dealing with, we're just shooting in the dark. And then I'll, I'll just give you a pharmacological, uh, if you wish, rubric that you know I teach to my students all the time. For any disease, invariably, uh, you know, the medical profession prescribes at least one drug and some supplement. Okay? Uh, so for, for every five years of our life, we add another disease. Uh, and therefore, we add two more drugs and two supplements. For every two supplements or drugs, there's a 50% chance of unwanted drug interactions. For, for someone in their 50s with four, you know, four different conditions, and many of, of these individuals have a lot of comorbidities, I, I'm afraid that many of the symptoms might be just adverse effects to whatever we give these children, hoping that we're doing better and, and we're not. And adults, adults for that matter. I mean, to give you an example, uh, you know, I, I remember years back, I was an interstitial cystitis meeting. Uh, there's this bladder condition, bladder inflammation, but it's sterile inflammation. And of course, uh, you know, many of these patients have a lot of allergies. So, you know, one patient said, well, I don't understand what is going here. I'm actually in retention, even though I have interstitial cystitis, which is, of course, very common voiding. And I said, how much of what are you taking? She goes, I'm on 200 milligrams Benadryl. I said, no wonder. You know, all the antihistamines are also anticholinergic. They'll put you in retention. Uh, they'll, they'll make your mouth dry. You know, your brain will be fried. You, you won't be able to think. So we cannot just look at the children, adults, whomever, in isolation. And the sooner we understand that there are other comorbidities that might be contributing to the behavior, the sooner we will realize that the behavior might not be pathologic, but it might be a response to something else that is happening. That's why I recently decided to be using the term, let nature help you be your best, because I really think that we're not dealing with a pathology that needs to be you know, turned off, so to speak. We just need to allow the body, the brain, to rebalance itself however we can do that. You know, it might be drugs, it might be supplements, uh, et cetera. So there. I lost you. I, I cannot hear you anymore. My okay. apologies. I am working in a clinic with autistic children today, so I do get some noise in the background, which is why I don't occasionally. And, and, um, yeah, go ahead. I actually wanted uh, Suzanne to ask this next question, if she could. Oh, uh, sure. I, I could ask that question. Um, I also see a question, question about the books that I, I will ask if no uh, one else has it. It's important. Go ahead. Sure. A viewer wants to know um, her daughter has improved in every area except conversational speech. Are mast cells involved in preventing advancing in speech? I wouldn't say mast cells directly, but the mast cells in the amygdala do communicate uh, with uh, um, uh, parts of the brain that regulate both muscles and the Broca area that is involved in speech. Um, I see this a lot. In other words, uh, let's say that uh, you know some child, you know, four years old, has you know some allergies, and maybe the mother had a little asthma, whatever. And uh, now he's having, you know, the typical, you know, behavior and doesn't say a word. Okay? So most of the time, you know, by addressing the hyperactivity and, and, you know, some antihistamines and some of the, you know, flavonoid products, et cetera, within six months, at the latest, we see difference in behavior. I'll come to the speech in a second. In terms of, you know, better eye <clears throat> contact, uh, following more complicated commands, being more sociable, you know, start holding, let's say, a spoon or whatever, and eating a little better. Uh, the, invariably, I would say almost 90% of the children will get better, especially if, if we have to remove gluten or casein if we absolutely know that that's a problem. With, with language, it takes longer. It's taken me up to two years, but I would say that most of the children, and I only see children now from abroad, you know, I, I don't see patients in the States anymore, uh, but I still have a lot of patients from, from everywhere in Europe. Uh, there are two things that I absolutely need. 
Number one, I need to give them more calcium folinate. So I go after the MTHFR gene. There might be mutation, there might be one, two or three mutations. I've never seen four mutations. So depending how much, I'll give them calcium folinate uh, because the methylfolate is only part of the active form of folic acid while calcium folinate gets in. So I will give them five milligrams calcium folinate a day. And it exists both generic in the United States as well as <clears throat> uh, 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 tra trademark. Uh, that's number one. Number two, especially if they're a little hyper, there are two studies showing that propranolol, the beta blocker, not only helps with hyperactivity, but it increases language as well. So for those children, I'll put them on propranolol sooner rather than later. You know, if they're very small, five milligrams. If you know they're five, six, can be 10 milligrams, as long as they don't have asthma. And you can see the publications. And then what I find, which is fascinating, is they will start using syllables that make sense, even though they might not, like for instance, they might say to their father, no, you know, like don't do this, but it would be used in the right context. So don't expect, you know, fluency right away. And then you will start seeing, you know, two syllables. And what is absolutely fascinating, those children that speak, speak without having gone through like, you know, the way, you know, we start, you know, in kindergarten and grade one or whatever, they start using full sentences. So that means that they really are so smart that they take down what they hear and when they break out, they just speak. The best such case that I ever had was a child seven years old in Cyprus. I was working with him for two years. And two years later, no word at all, okay? He went on public television talking about the solar system and you know, everybody freaked out. So these children can't talk. I have no doubt about it. Now, Dr. Fry has identified a condition he calls global cerebral folate deficiency, where these children have receptors against the folate, uh, antibodies against the folate receptor and block folate from going in the cells. That's even worse. So imagine someone not being able to get the folate in the brain cells and then having MTHFR mutations that cannot turn it into its active form. There's only one company in the world called Iliad, I-L-I-A-D in New York, that measures antifolate receptor antibodies. And they'll send you a kit, you prick the finger, send it back, it costs about $200, I think, and they'll tell you you've got those. Because if those are present, and according to Dr. Fry, they might be present in as many as 10% of the kids that do not speak. Dr. Fry gives as many as much as 50, five zero milligrams calcium folinate a day, and he's published a paper on that. Um, so so it, it all depends what the, so I usually try with my colleagues to address all the other symptoms that are addressable. I try to encourage the parents that it might take three to six months for some of the behavior to get better, especially if the allergies and other things get better. And then it's a matter of, you know, patience, which I know you all have, uh, and time to allow for the language uh, to, to come out. Now, in some children, there are some children that just doesn't come back. Uh, and I don't know why. You know, maybe the inflammation there is much more severe. It is those children where, number one, a SPECT scan might be telling because if a SPECT scan makes, you know, the brain light up, then I would really worry. And it is in those children that we have to put something up the nose to allow more of the anti-inflammation, anti-allergy, et cetera, uh, to occur. So I'm, I'm begging everybody, if you know anybody who can, you know, come up with some money to help us make an intranasal, I think we're gonna help a lot of people. So thank you for listening again. Dr. Thea Hardys, there have been a couple of um, viewers who are interested in helping further your research and um, one who would like to see if their child can participate in your research from, from outside the US. I was wondering okay. if you could say a little bit about how they could um, right, contribute right, right. to that. I apologize. Uh, first of all, uh, there's no ongoing research in terms of a clinical study for which people can participate. Okay, so that's out of the question. There's no such study. Unfortunately, the only, the only studies going on now is testing more antipsychotic and anti-schizophrenic drugs yet uh, in autism. Well, we know they're going to work if someone is, you know, self-destructive, and I use them sometimes too, you know, before I allow time uh, to help, uh, you know, heal the body. 
so there's no way to participate as such. The one thing I can say to anybody, because you know science progresses, whether it's ours or someone else's, um, if any at any time blood is drawn from your child, wherever you are, for anything, see if you can ask them to save what we call one red top or one tube of serum. So the difference is, you know, you've got the blood with the cells and then everything else. Uh, if you allow it to clot, then everything drops down. Uh, usually if you allow the blood at room temperature about 50 minutes it clots, and then you have the serum that stays at the top. That's easy to separate, put it into another tube and freeze it in your freezer box. It can keep up to a year for things that we might be able to measure, we or any other colleague. And that's the best way to, to, to save something that might be useful kind of for the future, if not kind of right away. Now, as we move forward, if studies develop, then we might request blood, but blood to come into the United States with the COVID restrictions, now it's impossible. Don't even think about it. Uh, so it, it, it's very, very difficult. Uh, the one thing that can happen, especially if someone is abroad and I can handle them, uh, otherwise, there are a couple of colleagues that I've chosen that I believe are, are thinking along the same line, so to speak, uh, in which case for the United States, what I do sometimes is I might refer, uh, you know, especially a difficult case to a colleague that I, I think highly of, and then we can Zoom and I can act as a consultant for them. Okay? And this, this can be true for anybody for that matter, but I cannot do it on my own since I don't see patients uh, anymore. Um, so that's and the question was, you know, do you see patients by telehealth? And I was just saying, I cannot do them physically because I, I don't keep my, I didn't, I don't have my license anymore. I'm 71 and I said, to some extent, you know, this is what I can do. Uh, however, on, as I said, on occasion, uh, if I refer to someone, to another patient, to another physician, or if a particular colleague would like to ask for my opinion, then we can, you know, Skype or Zoom or, or you know, team, Microsoft team together, whatever. And then I can give my opinion, having heard the case, but then my opinion will go directly to my colleague and the colleague will be now provider. D does that make sense? I mean, that's, that's the only way I can Thank do you, it. Yeah. In this but any, anybody else that. outside the States, I, I, I can do it because I, I, I do it. I'm licensed to Europe, you know, Cyprus, et cetera, so I can do it. Okay. Okay. We need to wrap up now. We appreciate your time and all the valuable information that you've given to parents. Thank you. I'll refer parents to your website for any further questions they may have. And the video will be up on the um, Autism Research Coalition site um, for parents to view going forward. Thank you again, Dr. Theoharides. As we discussed, I will send you the slides and you can make the slides available. Uh, if, if you need to, uh, if anybody has particular questions that might be urgent, although urgent is hard to address, you might want to maybe send them to you, not to me directly, and then you can share them. If that's something the coalition can do, maybe you don't you don't do that. Um, and the reason I said that is I'm about five months behind answering, uh, you know, requests. So, you know, if something is, uh, you know, urgent, I hope it's not urgent. I don't want you to wait like five months before I catch up with everybody. So. Thank you on behalf of the autistic people. This will hopefully okay. help you, doctor. Okay. Bye. Bye.